uh, <coughs> excuse me, 2019. Uh, we have apologies from uh, Stuart Stevenson, who has another parliamentary commitment. Um, the first item on our agenda is going to be the Police Scotland's draft budget, 2019-2020. Uh, it's our main evidence item today with the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, uh, uh, Hamza Youssef, on the proposed policing budget for 2019-20. Um, I refer members to paper one, which is a note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I welcome Hamza Youssef, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and Gillian Russell, Director of Safe Communities, and Hilary Pearce, Interim Deputy Director, Police Division, Scottish Government. And, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary... Um, and indeed all others for their written submission, which is, as ever, are very helpful to the subcommittee. And uh, Cabinet Secretary, I understand you wish to make some brief opening remarks. Thank you, uh, Convener. Just uh, some brief remarks. Uh, last month, the Finance Secretary published a draft budget which seeks to strengthen Scotland's economy, deliver long-term investment and to transform public services. I believe that within the budget are a number of significant gains for policing in Scotland, not least the Scottish Government's budget for policing in 2019-20 rising to over £1.2 billion. We're providing an additional £42.3 million for the Scottish Police Authority budget, an increase of 3.7% for 2019-20 compared to the 18-19 position. Uh, this means the police revenue budget will increase by an additional £30.3 million and the capital budget will increase by £12 million. That's a 52% increase, which I hope will fund further improvements to ICT infrastructure and will support Police Scotland's efforts to introduce mobile working to police officers. Our hardworking officers continue to be the public face of policing in Scotland and have contributed to a 42% fall in recorded crime since 2006-07. We are investing in both our officers and staff, including an additional £11.2 million to be invested in the workforce in 1920. This builds on the announcement of a 6.5% deal on officers' pay, which is putting significant cash into officers' pockets, giving them and their families certainty. We have uh, more officers than at any time during the previous administration, 17,147. That's still uh, 913 more than the figure we inherited in 2007. Uh, furthermore, the Chief Constable has decided this week to bring forward a campaign for the recruitment of 120 officers in this financial year to ensure capacity and resilience is in place to prepare against a range of contingencies associated with Brexit. We've also ensured that policing will fully benefit from being able to reclaim VAT of around £25 million a year previously paid to the UK government. To date, 15 letters have been sent to the UK government on police and fire VAT. Uh, we will continue to press the UK government over the £125 million already paid to HMRC for police VAT. However, convener, we must constantly bear in mind that despite the UK government's promise, promises, this budget will be set against the backdrop of continued austerity and the shadow of the UK government's frankly chaotic approach to Brexit. Uh, Brexit continues to hang over our economy, our public services, and risks, frankly, making us all poorer uh, in the future. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for that opening statement, Cabinet Secretary. And, and we've uh, <coughs> a considerable number of questions, and of course, uh, Brexit will feature in them. Wonder, can I, can I start, please, by asking you, <coughs> excuse me, the rationale for the decisions taken in terms of the overall budget proposed for policing in Scotland, and the Scottish government's policing priorities, please. Um, I suppose. Not to continue to, 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 to re-emphasise my, my opening statement, but I suspect they'll come back to some, some common themes which will help to answer uh, that question. Uh, protecting Police Scotland's revenue budget uh, in real terms during this Parliament clearly demonstrates uh, how much of a priority uh, policing is. Uh, that will deliver, as I said, a £100 million boost by, by 2021. Uh, in terms of this specific budget, uh, it's worth looking at the fact that we're continuing to invest in reform, so we know that there's still work to to be done in relation uh, to reform of the single service. Um, of course, uh, reclaiming uh, VAT uh, of, of £25 million, uh, that being put into the core budget uh, of Police Scotland uh, helps to, to bolster that budgetary position, which is so important at a time of real uh, uncertainty. I think the capital uplift is quite important, that 52% increase in the capital uplift. Uh, my hope would be, although of course it will be for SPA, and Police Scotland to determine that, that, that uh, my understanding is that uh, that uplift, most of that uplift will be used uh, for mobile working 
So again, uh, making sure our police service moves with the times in terms of technology, that will also be one of our uh, policing uh, priorities. And then, of course, uh, the overarching priority is to continue to maintain our communities, uh, the safety of our communities. We've had, we have a good record uh, of that, uh, as, as I've said, in, in, in the 11 years and over 11 years uh, that we have been uh, in government. Uh, to, to, we've seen crime uh, continue to fall. Of course, a slight uh, increase uh, last year, but we wanted the overall trend being one of recorded crime uh, falling. So, uh, yes, bolstering the foundations as we have them, continuing uh, absolutely uh, with the reform, investment uh, in technology uh, are just some of, of those priorities. Thank you. In their submission to us, the Scottish Police Federation say, and I quote here, in pure cash terms, the revenue funding proposed for 2019-20 still represents a reduction on that available prior to the establishment of the Police Service of Scotland. Is that correct, Cabinet Secretary? Well, if you think about it, uh, we've made no uh, bones about the fact, and we're you know, proud of the fact that um, there has been uh, efficiency savings. That was part of, um, uh, of course, uh, some of the rationale around the single uh, police service. We know also uh, that almost £200 million has been taken out of the cost base uh, in relation uh, to Police uh, Scotland. Uh, also, I'll add that to the almost £900 million of efficiency savings, uh, Police Scotland are, are, are well on track to, to meet those £1.1 billion savings. In fact, they'll make those according to their own submission to this committee uh, earlier than anticipated and, and, and hope to make just shy of £2 billion worth of saving come 2025-26. So um, when it comes to, to, to the savings that have been made, uh, they have been absolutely vital at a time, I think all of us could recognise, of extreme financial uh, restraint, time of austerity from the UK government affecting our budgets. It was absolutely essential uh, that those savings were found. Now, notwithstanding all of that, there will be revenue protection for the rest of this parliamentary term. OK, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Rona and then Daniel. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good afternoon, Cabinet Secretary. Um, in your opening statement, you um, mentioned the budget implications relating to Brexit. And um, I'm just wondering, and, and you talked about the 120 officers that Police Scotland are recruiting. Um, has there been a, an agreement reached with the UK government as to what extra funding we can have? And if there has, is, is it going to be enough? In short, no. Uh, there, there, there hasn't uh, been an agreement. Uh, from the Scottish government's perspective, we have always been across a range of government departments very clear that uh, we would not expect uh, the Scottish taxpayer to, to pay a penny uh, for an additional detrimental uh, impact uh, of any Brexit deal, be it a deal or, 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 or a no deal, because this is not a situation of our making, not a situation uh, that we support, uh, and therefore any detrimental impact and, uh, and budgetary terms uh, should should be covered by by the UK government. Now there has been, of course, uh, as as members will be aware, um, some consequentials uh, coming uh, our way. Uh, it'd be fair to say that we're still in negotiations with the UK. Uh, government, it's not clear that the funding uh, allocated to the Scottish Government will allow us to cover the full implications of the EU exit. Um, the issue of police funding for no deal consequent management uh, is still one of a number of issues that the Scottish Government is very actively pursuing. Um, with the UK Government now, I have to commend uh, the Chief Constable uh, and, and SPA for having, uh, I think, taken very prudent steps in relation to the, the bringing forward of the recruitment of 120 police officers. Uh, but of course, these things uh, all, all undoubtedly uh, come at a cost. Thank you. Um, on the VAT question that you also mentioned Excuse in your me, Rona, sorry. Just oh, sorry, supplementary on, on that just initial point. Just a supplementary point, cabinet secretary <coughs> on um, the possible need for um, a number of extra policemen in the the event of say a no deal or um, Brexit coming into to force. I wonder if the government's looked at the contingency, given the concerns from the SPA about recruitment, the ability to train within a, a necessary time frame, of perhaps um, recruiting uh, retired officers um, to cover that period of time, to bring them in and their expertise to be used in whichever way um, deemed um, appropriate to make sure that um, they have that resource there that can be used fairly um, quickly to make sure that there's there's no gaps in the service. I don't know if she was looking at the convener while she was saying that uh, <laughs> question uh, or not. But, uh, 
that, 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 that would ultimately, uh, that would ultimately, of course, uh, joking aside, that, that, that would ultimately be uh, a decision, of course, for for the, for the chief constable uh, and for SPA to to derive at. And my understanding is that uh, they effectively have, uh, you know, quite a full pipeline of those who want to enter into Police Scotland, which is which is uh, great for the reputation of Police Scotland. They can essentially turn on and turn off the tap or slow down or speed up um, the flow of, of, of recruitment uh, as and when uh, they, they, they would like. So my understanding is that they, they are in a good position to, to bring forward recruitment of those 120 officers. Uh, Police Scotland's ability to do that as the second largest force uh, in, in, in the United Kingdom means that no doubt other forces across uh, England and Wales and of course uh, Northern Ireland will look towards Police Scotland for potential mutual aid uh, requests. So uh, I, I don't know is the honest answer about whether they're looking at retired officers. I, I haven't seen that ac across my desk and I don't think that is the case, but I would have to get further clarification uh, for the member. My understanding is they are in a good place when it comes to, 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 to their ability to recruit relatively quickly. It was really referring to the SVA's um, letter to... Um I think all MSPs on 11th of December, where they said it's not just 120, we may be looking at many more officers needed very quickly, there won't be time to recruit and train, and therefore that may be a viable um, suggestion. Yeah, and, and as, as I say, it would be for, for, for SPA yeah. and, and, and Police Scotland to, to make that call. Thank you. Um, a further supplementary from... <coughs> yeah, I, I have further supplementary to the... Yeah, the issue surrounding Brexit, but also, um, <clears throat> as my colleague Margaret Ritchell raised around recruitment, has there been any analysis done, Cabinet Secretary, on any possible impact that uh, Brexit will have on recruitment in terms of uh, migration, EU citizen status, that type of thing? Uh, yes, I mean, Police Scotland are, are working uh, and have been uh, doing a, a kind of a trawl of, of staff and officers to determine, uh, of course, uh, what, how many EU citizens uh, they have as part of police uh, Scotland, uh, you know, is the Scottish government's intention that for anybody working in our public services, that the Scottish government picks up uh, the fee that, that we think is a is a dreadful uh, thing for any EU citizen to have to pay uh, in terms of uh, the, the, their settled status here in Scotland. So uh, that is being done. Uh, I don't have the numbers uh, of how many EU citizens uh, are both officers and staff, uh, but there's no doubt at all uh, from earlier work that I've seen. Uh, around uh, Brexit planning, uh, that EU citizens make a great contribution to our police service, uh, both in staff terms and, and, and also in officer terms uh, as well. In terms of, of, of the recruitment, I, I couldn't tell you again, it would be for, for Police Scotland to be able to update you uh, on that. But uh, you know, certainly from the passing out parade that I was at uh, and lucky to be at uh, in, in, in December, there was certainly, uh, from just a cursory glance, uh, quite a bit of diversity on showing that this is, is of strength to the Police Scotland uh, as opposed to, to, to anything else. Thank you. Keith Holden. Thank you. Um, go on. Yes, uh, just, um, you mentioned in your opening statement too about the um, VAT and the fact that you've been pressing the UK government um, for sort of back pay on that. Do you have a figure about what that would amount to that if we were successful in reclaiming that? 125 million would be uh, the number. Uh, having 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 been persuaded of the logic uh, of, of of the argument and and, and making a change uh, in in, in uh, VAT having to be paid, uh, it seems to me only fair that if you accept the logic of the argument that it was unfair to charge VAT and therefore they will stop doing that, it seems only logical that you think that they would uh, then give us back or police Scotland back what was paid. And and you know I, I don't need to tell. The, the, the committee here, or the subcommittee, what a difference uh, 125 million uh, could potentially make to, to ICT transformation or indeed to the police service as a, as a whole. OK, thank you. Thank you. Liam. Yeah, following that up, um, uh, following up Rona Mackay's question there, can we then take it that the 125 million that you feel is due uh, the Scottish Government in, in back pay, as it were, of VAT, um, that further investment in ICT is contingent on that 125 million being reallocated? No, it would be helpful. It would make a big, big difference. I don't have 125 million just at the back of the, 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 the sofa and having that 125 million to be able to spend uh, on uh, priorities like ICT, uh, there's other priorities, of course, uh, too, in, in policing, uh, would, would be remarkably helpful. Uh, in terms of the, the, the DDICT, <coughs> case which I know uh, the committee has, has examined uh, very thoroughly. Uh, I've had a number of meetings with Police Scotland 
and the ASP on that. They, they clearly have uh, an outline business case, which we will uh, and continue to, to robustly test. But the 52% increase, the £12 million increase in capital funding, and my understanding is that uh, uh, certainly uh, most of that, if not all of that, will be spent on um, uh, mobile working. That will mean you know, 10,000 frontline officers, those on the front line, will be given mobile devices. But you've, you've not suggested to Police Scotland, sorry, you, you've not suggested to Police Scotland that their bids, whether it's for um, DDICT um, funding or, or any other bid that they've made, is contingent on that £125 million. No, I've made it clear it's contingent on funding, of course, and resource, and, and having that £125 million from the UK government mm. would go a great way in helping towards that. You've also said that because the, the, the principle's been accepted um, by the UK government, the logic would suggest that that um, back payment of £125 million should now be made. Having accepted the principle that Orkney and Shetland's exclusion from road equivalent tariff was unfair, can we expect a back pay of eight years' worth of road equivalent tariff to be paid to the islands? Taking the same logic and the same principle. No, I, mean, I don't think it's the same logic. I mean, we always well, sure were, we, were, we were always going to phase RET, for example, over the Western Isles, and we always committed to look at RET uh, for Orkney. I mean, Orkney and Shetland Isles, of course, uh, benefited for things like air discount scheme and so on and I so forth. the Western Isles. Yes, but it benefited from a number of, 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 of various schemes. Uh, so I but think the, the logic is benefited from too. Is different. Uh, and, and but I mean, if he wishes, I, I, to, I mean, I, I'm surprised at the member because it seems to me that he's almost arguing against 125 no, I'm million just coming saying, to police. I'm Scotland, just comparing the logic, which I would have I'm thought. Comparing the logic, and I, and I, and I appreciate it was a, a liberal I'm democrat. The logic that you've applied in this uh, instance, within the, the treasury logic. at the time that withheld some of that money back. But I would expect him, uh, as I would expect most members, to come on board to get that 125 million for the police service. I'm really Absolute, surprised. That absolutely he's happy that. with that, uh, cabinet secretary. Yeah. But by the same token, I would expect the Scottish Government to then exercise the same logic and principle uh, in the way that it, it allocates uh, it, its own funding under powers uh, that it has a responsibility for. That is the, the point I'm making. To leave that one there, I Indeed. didn't envisage ferries would feature <laughs> too much today. I, um, I must confess. Um, and uh, that's maybe the legacy of your previous remit, Cabinet Secretary. I, I know Margaret wants one with a, a point on that. Ju well. Just the, a short question, um, Cabinet Secretary. Um, when the £25 million from um, the retrieval brat was allocated in March 2018, this was specifically to ensure that policing would fully benefit from it. In your opening statement, you mentioned it's gone to the core budget. Can you be more specific about how policing has specifically benefited from that £25 million? Um, well, the member may know that the, the, the change in VAT policy, which took place, um, took effect from, from March 2018, uh, allowed SPA to reclaim VAT. So that was broken down 22 million uh, revenue uh, VAT uh, funding provided by the SG uh, as part of, of, of the form budget. That was then added to uh, SPA's uh, core revenue budget in 18 19, uh, with obviously a corresponding 3 million uh, added to the core capital budget. Um, so, and if I take that revenue budget, that 22 million uh, has been utilised in a number of ways. Uh, 10 million uh, was for the additional cost of uh, officer pay awards. Uh, 5.6 million uh, for the compensation uh, related to SPRM. Uh, 2.1 million for uh, SPRA forensics uh, outsourcing of, of some of the backlog uh, work that existed. Um, 5.4 million was a transfer of a proportion of change posts to the core budget uh, where they became uh, permanent posts uh, as well. So um, that actually totals 23.1 million, so it's excess of uh, the VAT budget, meaning that uh, SPA Police Scotland had to absorb uh, around about 1.1 uh, million within its uh, existing uh, budget. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, thank you. Uh, Daniel. Thank you. So given that the SPA overspent by 38 million in 17-18. I was wondering what uh, the Cabinet Secretary's view the, of what the uh, spending deficit will be in 1918 based on this uh, budget. Well, can, can I say to the member that no deal Brexit planning and Brexit planning generally has been a complete game changer. Uh, so the de deficit reduction plans <coughs> that the SPA had, um, having to now reduce, uh, sorry, having to now bring forward uh, recruitment of officers, because you'll know deficit reduction plans 
uh, were predicated on, on, on uh, certainly from SPA's point of view, predicated on reduction of officer numbers, and that, that itself was predicated on them being able to demonstrate enhanced uh, operational capability. But nonetheless, uh, any reduction in police officer numbers, my understanding for the next financial year, for the first six months, for the first half of that financial year, will be halted. So therefore, potentially, it has the impact uh, of uh, of uh, uh, having an impact on, on, on the deficit reduction uh, plan. So uh, until we know what kind of Brexit we are looking at, what kind of deal we are looking at, clearly that's going to have an impact on every single one of our public services. Police Scotland is not uh, immune to that. Forgive me, Cabinet Secretary, but... Even leaving Brexit to one side, and I can completely accept it as a very large elephant in the room, but if we work from the basis that the SPA requested a revenue increase of 50.2 million but only received 30 million, and if we uh, look, start from the starting position that they asked for a capital increase of 90 million and only got 12, what is it that they're not going to be able to do as a basis of that budget settlement uh, uh, because because you yeah. must have had those conversations and they must have asked for that money for a reason. You'd have to ask uh, Police Scotland uh, what they can do within their settlement and what they couldn't do uh, now that they, that, that, that it's slightly different. I should go back to the revenue 50 million, uh, the reform I think you meant, uh, 50 million uh, ask. Uh, and I should say that 20, the, the, the reform uh, budget will, will stay the same as it did last year or this financial year. But remember, VAT and the reclaiming of VAT now goes into the core budget. Previously, that was paid via the reform uh, budget. But the, 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 the ask, uh, the additional asks, uh, be it of, of capital or be it of revenue, uh, my understanding uh, is that uh, that, that is not uh, necessarily uh, where, from, from where they devised their, their, their budget re deficit reduction plans. Uh, so uh, what they can no longer do... Um, you know, if they, 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 they do not have what they, they had initially requested, um, you know, there's something you would have to ask uh, the police authority and the police Scotland. But I go back and I maintain that if you strip all of this back, you're looking at a police budget that 2021 has £100 million additional being spent, uh, so revenue protection. This, or the next financial year coming, will have a 52% uplift in its capital. And the funding includes, for example, a pay officer award that has been described the best in the last dec uh, two decades. So we are providing a policing budget that absolutely reflects our policing priorities. Well, well, let me come to that pay award in a moment. But I have to say I'm very slightly surprised that the government setting a budget and isn't discussing with the SPA what it will and will not be able to do with that budget. I would have thought that was a, a fairly basic conversation to have. But if we look at that pay award, the, the revenue increase that, that, that Police Scotland is looking at is 2.8% in cash terms, which is an equivalent of 0.7% in real terms if you take out inflation. The pay award is 6%. If you look at the cost base of the police, only 13% is non-pay. So if they are spending 87% of their budget on their people, and you're only increasing their budget by 0.7%, but you've committed to a pay increase of 6%, surely that has a consequence on the numbers of people that they are able to employ. No, I'm not, I, I'm afraid, of, I mean, first of all, the, the pay award is 6.5% over 31 uh, months. And, you know, from, this was done, of course, in, in concert with Police Scotland, with SPA, with, of course, the Scottish Police Federation. And it was described by the Scottish Police Federation as, as the biggest uplift uh, in police officers' pay uh, for, for, for 20 years. When it comes to the first part of his question, of course we speak to Police Scotland uh, and, and SPA on a regular uh, basis in the run-up uh, to uh, the budget. There's no doubt, of course, that they will have big asks, DDICT perhaps, uh, and, and, and therefore the capital budget being being one of them. But we have allocated every single penny of our budget, and within that we have a revenue protection, a capital uplift, a great pay uh, award, hopefully not just for officers, but we'll get the staff pay over the line as well. Uh, and in the tight financial constraints that we have suffered, which is you know a £2 billion reduction in our revenue budget since 2011, I think that is a, is a, is a good and positive budget. Uh, 
Well, I'm sorry that the Cabinet Secretary wasn't uh, engaging with the numbers there because I think they were fairly clear, but he mentioned the, the Police Federation and, and uh, I think they've been relatively clear on the, the budget settlement. Uh, they think that um, the, the funding uh, uh, essentially only makes uh, allowances for 16,834 officers and their commentary on the, the levels of funding was, and I quote, it is utterly disingenuous of government to argue that the police service itself is arguing for a need to reduce police numbers when in reality it is starving it of funds to be able to maintain them. I was just wondering what the Cabinet Secretary's thoughts were on those remarks made. Well, I, mean, I work well with, with the Scottish Police uh, Federation. I looked at their, 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 their submission uh, in, in, in great detail, uh, actually. And, of course, we have 913 more officers uh, than we inherited in 2007, more than any previous uh, administration. And we know that Police Scotland is going to operate at a deficit in this financial year uh, and, and, of course, in, in 19 20 and we as a government have to balance uh, pressures and corporate pressures uh, on, on, on a yearly uh, basis. Now, we want to see a more efficient uh, police service, but we also understand and we agree with Police Scotland and the SPA that in light of everything that's going on, particularly Brexit related, now is not the time to make those reductions uh, in the immediate uh, short term. So uh, they're accepting that. Uh, they uh, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll do the job in terms of balancing the budget. But where there is, therefore, then a, a deficit, then, of course, we will have to work with SPA and Police Scotland to try to manage that right across the government, as we have done over a number of years, and we will continue to have to do so if that is the case. But does the Cabinet Secretary recognise the pressure that officers are being put under? And again, referring to the Police Federation uh, 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 submission, they were saying if you look at inspector level, that the number of hours worked by inspectors in Police Scotland is 30% uh, uh, um, over the number of inspectors that there actually are. There's a 30% essentially implied overtime that they're required to work because of the workload. Do you not think that that reflects the, 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 the serious challenges that the, the, uh, the, the police are under? And, and surely that means that any reductions from current levels would place further strains on those very same officers. Can I say a few, a few things? One is I absolutely recognise how hard our officers work. I deal with them day in and day out in, in, in the job and the role that, that, that I do, and I always put on recognition. And that is why we think the 6.5% pay officer, the one uh, pay offer that's been described as the best in 20 years in terms of an uplift of pay, putting cash into the pockets of of officers, is, 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 is one that uh, we made. It was, uh, of course... Uh, you know, did, did come with uh, significant uh, financial uh, implications, which we will rise to that. But the reason we've done that, because we recognise the pressure that officers of all ranks, frankly, uh, are, are under. And they've done an exceptional job in keeping us safe uh, and, and, and um, the reduction in crime uh, that we've seen. So, yes, uh, we, we, we recognise that. I will continue to, to have a positive relationship with the Scottish Police Federation, where we can do more, we absolutely will. It'd be worth me saying to, to Daniel Johnson that neither his party, nor uh, as uh, far as I'm aware, the most majority of parties around this table committed to a magic number when it came to police officers in their last Holyrood manifesto. I think it's absolutely right that the Chief Constable retains the flexibility he needs in order to have a balanced workforce. Before moving to Mark, can I ask um, Cabinet Secretary, one, one of the difficulties I certainly struggle with is, and you mentioned the figure, I think, of just short of £2 billion, I think it's one9 or something is mentioned in there, <coughs> the cumulative savings over the, the period. In this coming financial year, is there an expectation that Police Scotland and the SP will contribute to that continuing fund of savings? Uh, I think they'll continue to accumulate efficiency savings, yes. And that, will that have any impact in operational policing? Uh, well, again, it would be, you know, operational policing I always leave to, to the Chief Constable, but uh, for me, uh, you know, the Chief Constable makes those operational decisions on a day-by-day -day basis, depending on the context in front of him, Brexit being, uh, of course, one that is at the absolute forefront of his mind. So uh, by bringing forward recruitment of 120 officers, clearly uh, he is demonstrating uh, his ability to be able to have that flexibility. But, uh, uh, you know, clearly the decisions that we make, revenue protection, uplifting capital, have uh, operational effect, but I would hope it would be a positive operational impact. 
and again, touching on the Scottish Police Federation uh, submission to us, uh, where they talk about um, slack for the unexpected, is there slack for the unexpected part of the, 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 the budget settlement? Um, I, again, I suppose it goes back to maybe my, my, my answer to, to, to Daniel Johnson that um, we know from SPA's own um, deficit reduction plans, the three-year implementation plan, that they expect to operate a deficit in the coming financial year. And therefore, as a government, we will have to, as we have done in previous years, uh, take that on as a, as, as a corporate pressure. So there is an element of slack, I suppose, uh, in that regard. OK, thank you. Um, Margaret, I think, has some questions on that. Uh, yes, on, on the SPA, whether the proposed budget for the SPA will cover the extra staff that's being proposed for this, which is going from, well, I think it's already increased from 27 to 40, and um, the SPA chair is, is requesting an increase to a staggering 68. That's more than 100% of uh, an increase in, in staff to SPA. Um, from the 27 number, can the Cabinet Secretary quantify how much that is, how much that will affect the budget, and if these are full-time positions? Uh, that would be for, for the SPA uh, Chair to, to, to answer that. It would be for uh, the SPA to, to then manage that element of the budget. So SPA corporate, SPA forensics, and then the, the police budget would be for... I mean, my understanding is, and I look towards my officials, but I mean, I think the SPA corporate side of it is, is you know, accounts for 0.4% of, 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 of the entire budget. So it's a minuscule part. So as a government, you know, as cabinet secretary, I wouldn't look to, to micromanage that uh, in, in any way or any sense. It would really be for the SPA chair if, if she feels that there's the flex to, to, to increase posts, then uh, she would have to manage that against the, the budget that's been given. Forgive me, Cabinet Secretary, I thought it was a pretty basic question that more than 100% increase from 27, now up to 68, and there's there's kind of no kind of dialogue on, on that at a time when our frontline police forces, we know, are, are facing huge challenges uh, and have been not um, slow, really, to, to detail w with a lot of evidence where these challenges are. I don't think it's an unreasonable question that the government should question the SP as to the rationale behind this, if these are full-time posts, the need for this huge increase in yes, staffing numbers there, in the there are, Margaret Mitchell will forgive me, I mean, there, are, there are discussions on that, but you either have to accept that the, the SPA has a role in terms of managing the budget and your role, of course, in scrutinising that and the government's role, of course, in my continued meetings with the SPA chair and indeed with the SPA uh, board, which, I, which I'll be having shortly. Uh, of course, we all have a role in that. Uh, mm -hmm. But to absolutely micromanage 0.4% uh, of the budget, I have to be able to give the SPA uh, chair the flex uh, and, and, and the autonomy uh, to get on with the job that she has been tasked uh, to do. The 27 members of staff, my understanding is, having spoken to, to, to officials around this subject, uh, was, was, was absolutely on the lower level of what was envisaged when SPA was set up. There was a number of vacancies at the time. Uh, when they had uh, when they had 27 members of staff, uh, it was always the case that, that the number was going to be uh, higher, closer to the 50 to 60 mark. So this wouldn't be out with the uh, out with the you know outrageously beyond uh, the limits of, of of what we'd expect. And of course, we'll continue dialogue with, with Susan Deacon and the team at SPA around the need for those posts, uh, making sure that there was of course because we all know that there's intense, rightly scrutiny. Uh, on the SPA budget, but equally, I think all of us would recognise, even the harsh, harshest critics uh, of, of Police Scotland, the, the immense job that I think the chair uh, of, of the SPA uh, has done, working uh, extremely hard, and has got the SPA, I think, in, in, in a good place in relation to its governance and its transparency and its accountability. Uh, but I also, and I hope you know, there is an understanding of this that for, for 0.4% of, 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 the, of the budget that relates spe specifically to SBA staff, yes, we will question, yes, we will have dialogue, but really, I will not look to micromanage that and we'll need to give the SPA chair the autonomy she needs. 
Well, I wonder then if you could just answer the, the, the question I started with, Cabinet Secretary, given that there's 46 million increase 17-18, um, the 42 million seems to be the increase proposed now from 17-18, and then 42 million now, that's 88 million over the, since 2017. Does the current, and that's the, the original question, whether the proposed budget for the ex-SPA proposed, does that cover the extra, um, extra staff that this body is asking for? Uh, well, yes, in the sense that it would be for, uh, again, the SPA to, 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 so to, to manage the their budget. But uh, yes, uh, it would be uh, for the chair to, to, to manage that budget. If she wishes to increase her staff, she would have to do it, uh, whether it's for SPA corporate, whether it's for SPA forensics, whether it's police budget, it would be for her uh, and, of course, Police Scotland to, to, to manage that. Right. And can I finally ask you, you mentioned role and, of course, accountability, transparency, um, crucially important. Do you think it was wise, given the, the role of the SPA as it currently stands, which is not only to, to oversee, suggest improvements, but to, to scrutinise and, and sometimes have to criticise the, the police force, that they chose to make a, a joint submission on the budget from Police Scotland and the SPA? Isn't that rather blurring the, the lines? Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, I can see my officials intimate that they want to come in in a second. But, um, you know, I, I think it's... I, I, what I found quite refreshing, and maybe this is counterintuitive uh, about the submission uh, or the joint submission, was that they, that they were really challenging government. And, and, of course, you have put some of those challenges uh, towards me. I mean, any suggestion here that uh, SPA or Police Scotland simply roll over uh, to do what, what government uh, demands is, is clearly not the case if you look at the submission in terms of their, their, their requests and their asks. Uh, and I think that's a, a positive, but I, can, I see that uh, Hilary wanted to, to come in on that point. Um, it, <coughs> excuse me. It's perhaps worth adding that the accountable officer for the SPA, um, that is the chief executive, Hugh Grover, is responsible statutorily for the entirety of the policing budget. So, therefore, uh, strictly the submission should fall for the response to the draft budget should come from the accountable officer for the, the whole of it. That's the position. Okay, thank you. So you might... another question. Thank you. Yeah. you know? uh, if nobody else has... No, no, there's some... Yeah. Um, Liam? You, you were wondering... Do you want to turn to the... Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, if I could touch on the, the issues in relation to... Um, to fleet management and the estate. Uh, for the avoidance of doubt, this is not the police's ferry fleet um, we're talking about here. Um, the <laughs> although we may come on to that. <laughs> um, you'll be aware of concerns that were raised with the, the subcommittee previously, um, expressed in, in our report, in fact, um, that Police Scotland's current capital grant of 23 million will not be sufficient to maintain its existing capital asset base uh, and that it has an overspend of around £6 million per year on fleet management. Uh, you've rightly pointed to the uplift in capital of around £12 million, but as I understand it, that's earmarked uh, for ICT and therefore it would appear that that £6 million overspend that Police Scotland ident identify is likely to continue for the foreseeable future. Is that a sustainable position for Police Scotland to find themselves in? What are the implications <coughs> of that? So, so I'm, I'm always um, open to, to dialogue with Police Scotland uh, and the SPA around uh, their capital ask. I, I think you know, for the size of the organisation they are, they often point to, to the size of the capital allocation. I think there's a fair uh, argument for them to, to, to advance, hence the 52% uh, increase. Now, I would make the point that if we hadn't increased by 52%, we hadn't given that additional 12 million, then of the 23 million uh, capital uh, that they would have been awarded, they would have had to have no doubt uh, move forward with that uh, mobilisation um, or mobility uh, programme. Uh, as well as their capital, fleet renewal and estates renewal and so on and so forth. So uh, the, 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 the increase of 52% and the capital uplift, excuse me, I think is, is significant. It shouldn't be uh, dismissed. I know the member's not dismissing it, but it shouldn't be dismissed. Um, but in terms of the wider question uh, around the, the, the capital ask, I'm, I'm, I have committed to the SPA chair in our last conversation to sit down uh, with her and her, her, her team to, to look at this question in more detail uh, for an advance of, of, of the next uh, spending uh, review. Of course, 
um, money is tight uh, all round, and, and I won't rehearse the reasons uh, for that. Uh, but uh, the, the the argument uh, around this, I think, is one that um, I'm certainly open minded to listening to. Well, I, I appreciate that willingness to continue the the, the dialogue. I mean, I think um, the point that's been made to yeah. us in relation to the the capital uplift is it it falls short, even in relation to to what's needed um, specifically for ICT. But as the police federation have, have, have pointed out. Um, the continuation of that um, that, that requirement to uh, to overspend is going to see the fleet and buildings uh, further decline uh, over the forthcoming 12 uh, months, and that doesn't seem to be, as I say, a sustainable position for the police to be in on an ongoing basis. I will we'll meet with the SPF uh, as I do on a, on a regular basis, but I will ensure that the, the, the issue on capital uh, is, is raised uh, and discussed at our next meeting. We, we did discuss it when I, when I went to meet with their, their, their various regional uh, committees, uh, and there was some um, questions around uh, capital and, and, and some of uh, the conditions uh, of, of the estate and the fleet. Uh, and I did uh, promise to continue that dialogue going, but look, I, I, I operate uh, within a certain financial envelope. He knows that the government is itself restricted in terms of its uh, finances, again, because of a variety uh, of factors. Uh, I'm pleased that we've got to a 52% increase. I mean, that was, believe it or not, you know, as hard fought. Um, but uh, I recognise the argument. I, I, you know, I have some sympathy with the argument around the size of the organisation versus the size of the capital allocation. So all, all I can do at this stage is continue to engage with both SPF, SPA, uh, Police Scotland uh, on these matters and continue to, to update this parliament on those discussions. I, I, I welcome that. I mean, I think it, it's worth, again, putting on, on record what SPF have, have said in relation to the specific issues uh, where they're saying that they cannot emphasise enough how limiting uh, this is for the police service. So I think the urgency of, of, of getting some uh, certainty and some certainty over uh, a longer period rather than an annual basis is, is absolutely imperative. But I, I suspect we've had that assurance from the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Um, Fulton. Uh, thanks, Peter. And um, if the committee and the Cabinet Secretary will forgive me for, for raising a, a constituency issue, I have to say, a relevant constituency issue, um, you'll be aware that Gartclough's Crane Campus is, is in my area and um, the parking around it has have been quite a local concern that's made it to the national news and to the, the chamber and I know the cabinet secretary will be aware of it. I'm very aware that that, that, that money is tight but given that the concern that this has been been raised around this and the impact it's having directly on the Gartkosh community I wonder if he would commit to um, speaking to his officials uh, based at the site or the, the heads of service there to look at if there's any further solutions that can be found. Yes, I, mean, I don't know if the member was in the chamber or not, but I mean, I answered a general question on this earlier uh, in, in, in the afternoon. Um, there, there is, in my understanding, actually a meeting uh, today which uh, a Scottish Government official is taking uh, part in uh, around this. I think um, there's a piece of land uh, adjacent to, to, to Gartkosh, which is potentially a new site for, for, for Monklands. There's a review going on around the consultation of, 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 of that. So we won't know, but uh, I suppose on, on, on both scenarios, whether it does become the site for the new Monklands or not, I've asked my officials to prepare options for whether or not the land could potentially be used. So if it was the site of the new Monklands, could there be a shared transport strategy which could assist uh, the, the, the parking issue at Gartkosh? If it's not, then can, as the owners of that land, can we uh, look at that, uh, or even part of that land being, being used to assist with that? Um, parking uh, issue, so I'm, I'm happy to take that away. Officials are to come back to me with, with options. Uh, um, I'm happy to keep the member uh, and relevant members up to date uh, on that. I, I just missed the, the question in the chamber today, but I was aware it had been asked. Thanks very much for that response. Thank you. Okay, I'm not awfully sure how that impacts on our subject here, but you got that in there. And, and I'm glad to hear you say transport strategy, because hopefully that could be a number of bus stops rather than a whole load of more car parking spaces. The reason, then, I think, full to the question <laughs> is, is pretty fair. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was going to ICT. Yeah, it's not ICT. Right, so okay. If you want to okay. A couple of questions, if I may, uh, please, Cabinet Secretary, on the ICT strategy and the impact of phasing it uh, will have on uh, expected efficiency savings and reducing the deficit. Um, yes, I mean 
the, the ICT presentation that I received from uh, Police Scotland, uh, there's no doubt that all of us here recognise the need to invest in, in, in ICT. Mobility and mobile working is certainly a, a part of that. I think many of us um, you know, uh, really have a lot of sympathy for, for officers who are still having to use notepad, pen, not having access, or having to use their own mobile devices for a whole host of, uh, of, 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 of reasons and that, that, that can't be right and, and, and isn't right. So I'm pleased that we have the capital uplift, which will, uh, which will invest in that. O on the wider question, uh, I think there is um, absolute um, uh, truth in the, the, the argument that investing in ICT, significant investment in ICT, Will help to realise further efficiencies. Uh, I've got got no doubt uh, in that argument uh, at all. It w is worth saying that um, without that level of investment, uh, the Police Scotland have managed to to or almost got to the figure of nine hundred million pounds of efficiency savings, and in their own submission, they expect to get to that one point one figure earlier, and, and, and probably to the one point nine billion figure if I remember it was twenty five. 26 by year 2025, 20, 26. So, um, although not contingent on that investment, I think the, the argument for investment, not just for future efficiencies, as important as, as that is, but to keep our community safe, to fight against some of the, the major technological challenges that we face in relation to, to cyber crime uh, and, and so on and so forth, I think that investment in, in ICT is certainly something we're open minded to. Now, we have an outline business case. Um, I think when Kenneth Hall came here to give you uh, evidence in, in October, he talked about the fact that each component will have to have a full business case uh, as we progress forward. We, we, we really need to test some of those figures. And, uh, you know, the committee, certainly uh, with your experience collectively, you don't need me to, to remind you about the, the kind of issues around I-6, which, again, we don't want to, 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 to repeat. Can I, I wonder if you express a view. You, you'll be aware that the um, committee looked in some detail at the issue of what's become known as cyber kiosks. And there was a considerable expenditure, just short of a threshold that would have triggered it to go to the police authority, just short of half a million. Um, now, that equipment, uh, which was trialled without any assessments being made, um, following a couple of sessions at this committee, it's the case that it's, it's not being the, the rollout of that hasn't proceeded because. Um, Police Scotland don't have a legal basis. Have you done anything to ensure that there'll be no repetition of that approach? Because it's, you know, we, we do hear about strategies, we do hear about plans. That's completely black to front if you acquire uh, equipment that you don't know if you have a legal basis prior to deploying it. Well, I think a couple of things to say. If, you know, I, I understand that in November there, there was legal concerns raised by a number of, of stakeholders. I have to say stakeholders I have an, an immense amount of uh, respect and, and, and time for. Therefore, Police Scotland are doing, doing the right thing in terms of halting any further investment and, and re-examining uh, their the legal basis. They, they certainly believe they have the legal basis to do what they're doing in relation to, 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 to cyber resilience uh, and in relation to the cyber kiosk plan. Uh, but it is prudent and correct for them to re-examine that and re-explore that. Now, I would expect that, um, you know, uh, and police would only do this, of course, when it comes to seizing phones or other electronic dis uh, electronic devices, that there would be a legal basis uh, for, 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 for doing so. Um, I certainly see um, the, 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 the logic, and I think most of the committee would, uh, you know, we are, most of us, if not all of us, on social media to some extent. Um, you know, I don't doubt that most of us that are on social media have probably been targets and victims of, of, of a variety of uh, abuse and trolling on, on that social media, and therefore, uh, you know, that is just one element uh, of uh, being able to tackle that kind of behaviour. Uh, particularly abuse, uh, be it racial or homophobic or anything else. It was, else. wasn't so much, sorry for interrupting, Kevin, it wasn't so much the, the merits of, of the equipment, it was more the process that had been followed, sure. or rather hadn't been followed in relation to that. Yeah. And really probably seeking an assurance from you that with the figures that in front of us, considerable expenditure on respect of ICT, that that... that uh, that approach, that failed approach, has been noted and won't be replicated. Well, my understanding is that the investment is being halted, as I've said, and the legal basis uh, for that is is, is being, uh, you know, is being uh, re-examined uh, in order to give assurance and confidence. But I think the merits of of the principle are just important to emphasise that this is the reason why what is being done is being done. But I, I accept um, the convener's point around process. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I understand, Liam, um, you wish a supplementary on this? On, on cyber kiosk, no. No, OK, I beg your pardon, it's Margaret. Uh, thank you. Just talking about the technology aspect, um, Cabinet Secretary, in the SPA submission, it says that technology has lagged and continued to lag a long way behind um, England and Wales, and specifically, um, they refer to the financial plan for 1920 contains assumed productivity gains, but it's clear that these purported gains are made in splendid isolation to the reality of the actual capacity and burgeoning demand. That's a pretty um, daunting and, and worrying statement. Can you comment on that, perhaps? That's from the SPF submission. That's from this. Um, SPF, yeah. Yeah, not the SPF. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, <coughs> you know, I, I, again, I, I reiterate and repeat what I say. I work well with the SPF, uh, and have a good relationship with them. I, I would suggest, though, in their submission, there is a touch of hyperbole. I mean, describing the the the, the settlement as a, as a potential potentially catastrophic funding settlement when we are protecting revenue, uplifting capital by 52%, in their own words, providing a pay offer that is uh, that is the best in 20 years to officers, would suggest, I think, that, um, you know, I understand the job that they... Point. Yes, on, on, on the job that they have to do, I, I can see why they push government hard. And technology, I go back to my answer to, 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 to Liam MacArthur, that uh, I accept the wider principle that um, we absolutely have to invest in, 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 in ICT. I think, uh, you know, Police Scotland uh, is not where they want to be clearly uh, when it comes to the technology. Uh, that is why the 52% uplift is certainly, uh, I would hope, uh, a statement of, of our intent. But clearly, uh, as I continue to talk to SPA and Police Scotland um, about the DDICT, uh, outline business case that they have as we continue to interrogate that then I hope that we make progress because investment in ICT over uh, the coming years is going to be absolutely important. And we both attend the awards uh, um, ceremony for the, the Police Federation and they do put themselves day in day out in incredibly um, challenging and sometimes very diligent situations and I think the least we can do, Cabinet Secretary, is ensure they have the tools to do the job. So I would just make a plea to you again that you look at that budget because that's intrinsic to ensuring they do have these tools. Mm. I don't agree with, uh, I don't disagree, sorry, with, uh, with anything she says there. I, I know uh, only full well the, uh, the, uh, uh, the risks and the dangers that police officers put themselves into and having attended not just that award but... Uh, the National Memorial Service as well as the Scottish Memorial Service, and I think uh, the the, uh, the member will have attended such similar uh, such events, and they do uh, bring to bear the the risk that officers put themselves in. So yes, absolutely investment, uh, and and in ICT, uh, and then of course, uh, and, and and that's why the the six point five percent pay off pay offer over thirty one months is also important. It is a recognition of that bravery and, uh, you know, as I say, it's in stark contrast to, to other governments uh, on this island that haven't, uh, I think, rewarded that bravery. Yeah. Um, also in the SPS uh, mission, they make a very good point, I think, about the vulnerabilities created from the police service from maybe central funding and that some form of resolution was required. For example, um, the directed, directly funded local authority police officers. We know in Edinburgh, for example, then they are not going to um, they are not going to fund. I think it was 25, it might be 40 police officers. Are there other local authorities in the same situation? They say they simply can't afford it with the local government settlement. Well, I mean, I go back to. The point that was made in the chamber, in fact, FMQ is, of course, about a, a, a real terms uh, increase uh, in terms of, of, of uh, local government budgets, but I, I, I don't disagree with the point that, uh, of course, over the years, over the preceding years, it has been a very challenging circumstance uh, for, for, for local authorities. I was quite heartened by uh, the new chief constable when he first took post um, a, a number of months ago, saying that uh, he wanted to see uh, the further devolution of decision making uh, to to local levels um, uh, and, and, and to local communities. I, I thought that was 
very encouraging. Um, I know that Police Scotland enjoy a very strong relationship at a local level with councils uh, through the, 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 the local scrutiny arrangements and, can, and community planning arrangements. Um, but ultimately, I suppose, decisions about funding uh, of local community officers by local governments are indeed a, a matter for, for each local authority. But is the Cabinet Secretary aware of any other local authorities, in addition to Edinburgh, who are now saying we can no longer um, additionally uh, provide, the, provide the finance for these officers? I mean, I know previous, uh, other local authorities that I, I work with. I mean, I'm a Glasgow MSP. I know uh, Glasgow City Council have, have also raised issues around uh, their ability uh, to, to, to fund uh, local officers. But, uh, you know, I haven't had anything come into me as far as I'm aware from a particular local authority. I'd have to go check over my documentations and, and, and correspondence, but I don't think I've had anything specifically from a particular local authority saying that they're not uh, able to, to, to fund anything, certainly in my role in the last six months. But I could go back and have a look and come back to, to the, the, the committee. Wonder, would you be able to share that information with the, the, the committee? Yeah, I'm sure I should come back to the committee. <coughs> I, I, to I wonder if there's, if there's a broader issue around that and, and maybe when when finances were better in some uh, authorities, it was always seen as a good idea to fund officers. But if that funding's withdrawn, it subsequently leaves um, someone else picking up the tab. Can can you also maybe give us some clarity around the arrangements that have been put in place regarding, I don't know, contract service level agreement or the like, please? Uh, I know <coughs> from some particular examples where Police Scotland have seen the absolute merit, <coughs> excuse me, uh, and particular uh, officers and uh, additional officers in a particular locality, um, then they have at times absorbed that cost, yes. uh, and uh, that, that that is certainly my understanding. But uh, notwithstanding that, uh, I think the point you make uh, convener around uh, this issue uh, is one that uh, absolutely I will uh, reflect on, and I will try to get you more information around uh, where we have had uh, any correspondence from a local authority particular issues around um, uh, policing and, and, and the local government settlement. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Liam. Thanks very much. Cabinet Secretary, you've already I, I acknowledged, I think, on a number of occasions um, uh, the extremely difficult position that Scotland find themselves in in relation um, to their capital budget. Uh, Police Scotland made clear that in their outline business case for ICIT, um, over the next nine years, they would need something in the region of 300 million. You're right, Kenneth Hogg, I think, also made clear that each component of that would be subject to its own detailed business case, which suggests that the picture over those nine years wouldn't be um, necessarily yeah. a smooth, uh, a, a smooth pathway um, uh, in, in, any, in any sense. But I think the uplift that we've seen um, of, of 12 million does appear to be some way short of um, the sorts of trajectory we need to be on to hit that target of a, around about 300 million over the, the nine years. So the concern would be, um, in, in Kenneth Hogg's view, that the do-nothing approach would still cost Police Scotland around £100 million to, um, to, to maintain increasingly redundant and less effective systems. So have you had any assurance that with the, the, the funding you've made available, is Police Scotland going to be in the situation effectively where it's throwing good money after bad? Um, maintaining increasingly redundant and, and inefficient systems? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really good question. And, and uh, I know I'm the one uh, answering the questions, but I suppose my question back in some respects would be that I, I don't think any member would expect the government to fund a component part without a full and final and robustly tested mm. business case. And I think that would be, a, uh, I would hope that would be a reasonable uh, as assumption for, 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 for us to make, especially in the light of, for example, I6. ICT projects, um, but, but but notwithstanding again that uh, all, all of what the member says is is absolutely right. Um, you know the funding profile wouldn't be wouldn't be linear. Uh, I don't think um, we would have to. And we are now in the process of, of really robustly testing that DDICT case uh, that has come forward in its entirety. <coughs> now, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, because of the 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 uh, financial settlement for 1920, it may be the SPA have to reprofile um, that that spend, whether it's over nine years to perhaps a longer period, uh, or even a shorter period. It just depends on the the, the funding settlements uh, that we are able to provide in the next few years. But the immediate step has to be and is 
to really robustly interrogate and to test the outline business case. But I, I, and I think I mean, that seems entirely reasonable, certainly in relation to the detailed business case. I suppose the, the logical follow-on from that is that um, making that kind of business case uh, and profiling the, the expenditure in whatever way is, is required is enormously more difficult, indeed almost impossible, without some certainty beyond a 12-month period. Um, and therefore, I, I think the SPA, Police Scotland and the SPF, I think all at various stages have made a plea um, for a degree of, of longer term um, certainty around, uh, around expenditure. Yes, I think a very fair point. And the, the member will be not unaware of the fact that uh, my colleague Derek Mackay, Finance Secretary, has been pushing the UK government for, for multi-year uh, financial settlements, uh, which would be uh, helpful for us in turn to be able to then do the same. Uh, here, here in Scotland, but uh, in, in lieu of that, in absence of that, it uh, becomes very difficult for us to, to be able to commit, particularly um, during these really uncertain times around the impact that Brexit may or may not have. Although it is an area, I mean, we've, we've touched on this in, in, in other aspects of the justice portfolio, and I know Minister Jean Freeman, for example, in the health portfolio has made commitments of um, three-year cycles of, of funding. So, it, it, as I say, it may not be possible across the board for the reasons that you've suggested, but, but is this an area where there isn't a pretty compelling need for um, that certainty, irrespective of, of, of the position at a, at a UK level? So he's, he's not, of course he's not incorrect. In other parts of government, they, they are able to, to make funding commitments um, multi-year. I suppose what I would say to the member, you know, cognizant of the discussion we've, and very aware of the discussion we've just had, the capital ask, if it is even close to what is being asked for, around the DDICT project, then we're not talking about small numbers. We're talking about a really significant uplift in what the current capital expenditure and profile is of Police Scotland. So if the question is, would I be able to commit that multi-year, I'm not convinced at the moment. If his, if his question is, should the government be open-minded to that, and if it has the ability to do that, should do that, then without a shadow of a doubt, if we're able to do that, then, then clearly we would like to do that. But we're not talking about... Uh, small numbers by any stretch. We're talking about fairly significant uh, numbers, which are which would which would, 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 would in turn be a significant uplift in the capital expenditure. Okay, <coughs> okay cabinet secretary. Um, thank you very much indeed uh, f for your evidence. Uh, you, you've talked about some uncertainty, and and people would understand that, cabinet secretary. I'm sure you'll share with us if there's any significant budgetary or indeed policing implications of that uncertainty because we'd be very keen to understand that. So can I thank you and your officials for your attendance and conclude the meeting. Thank you.